Hey, I'm Dagny, and I'm in China. I'm so glad I finally get to share with you my experience on this trip. So while we are moving from the airport to my accommodations, uh, let me share with you what to expect, okay? I visited China to see my sister, and the trip was for nine days. This was the very first time I have ever been to Asia anywhere in the region of Asia. And we filled our time with quite a lot of adventures. So we explored the city Shenzhen, the city Guilin. We did a lot of walking. We explored a variety of food. We also climbed some mountains, saw a lot of historical sites, and really overall had a really enjoyable time. So in this video, I'm going to take you with me. And of course, we're going to make it a dramatic cinematic experience because why not? Also, at the end of this video, I'm also going to share with you some reflections that I had overall in terms of my trip, as well as what things I learned to add more layers to my understanding of Africa-China relations. Okay, are you ready? Cool, let's go. Mama is gonna take me to have dinner yeah. and explore a little bit. Yes. We're going by going pedestrian, walking, and then I think she said we're gonna take a bus. Yeah, if I can find it. Yeah, I think it's over here. Okay. Oh, this is the library on this side. I haven't okay. been to it yet. Let me show you guys a little bit of what is around us. Yeah. On my first day on this trip, I ended up sleeping the entire day. So by this time, I actually don't know what the city looks like in the daytime, but it's fine because I woke up just in time for dinner. So we had a very pleasant walk actually to get to the mall that had a variety of restaurants for us to choose from. came to choosing the restaurants I of course had to check every menu for each of them and I really appreciate actually that every single one of these menus which later in the trip I've discovered actually it seems like majority of restaurants do this their menus look like food magazines like they really take their time when it comes to the photography for the food so even if you're not fully understanding what's written down, you have a very good sense of what you are, what your options are, or what you're ordering. For my first meal, I had this green juice. It was an orange and kale and things like that, plus a vegetable dish, a salad, and some fries. To keep it fully 100, this meal tasted pretty basic. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It was okay, but not enough to feel like I really need to come back to this restaurant. But it was still a nice experience, nice ambiance, and fun time with my sister. After dinner, we headed down to the subway metro so that my sister could share with me the routing and other neighborhoods that are her walking grounds or stomping grounds.
Yeah, but she told me after the fact when he was supposed to be walking around in the sun. I mean, you know, that's not your play. That's I didn't not know. Play. I didn't know, but it's fine. <laughs> but yeah. I remember the next time. I, went, I mean, we're wearing SPF like, and we're black, right? but you know, it's fine. Yeah, I thought the melon was enough. I thought you the know? But yeah, it was so beautiful. Look at the blue sky. The next day, we continued our exploring and my sister Damali took me to a different neighborhood to go eat and walk around. Now this ended up being one of my favorite meals, so much so that we came back to this cafe a few days later so I could have the exact same thing. It was delicious, it was delectable, it was nutritious. All my greens that I loved, they understood the assignment. All right, we are done with our meal. Yes. We're now taking our siesta walk. Siesta, siesta, Where are we siesta. going again? I forget, she said we're going sea somewhere to look world. at something. Station. We're going to SeaWorld? Yeah, the SeaWorld area. That's where I met my um, teacher that used to work at. Uh, we can walk now? Yeah. We're walking. Yes, we're walking. We're crossing the street. Yes. <laughs> This space is called SeaWorld. Now, with my frame of reference, I was a little confused because there was no sea, then there was no Shamu, but it was still a lovely vibe in terms of there are shops and restaurants around. And actually later on in the day, there's a fountain light show as well in this area. Because it's midday, the sun is on us. Yeah, they use that to do a light show. And uh, I'm walking up downstairs. And it's hot. Mainly because like the sun is very bright. Because yeah. there is a breeze, it's fine. It's just yeah. because we're walking so much. True, true. But it's fine. No worries. We have our cooling yeah. clothing. Well, I do. I don't know what. Huh? I have cooling clothing on. I don't know what she's got on. But it's a vibe. Very empty though. Yeah. But yeah. Let me show you some angles. See, there's a whole ship over there. A whole ship, not an actual. A whole ship. No, it used to be. Uh huh. Oh, there's another eating place over there. Out of that. I see a place. I see Latina. Latina. We saw a Mexican place. Okay, breeze. Thank you. Yes. Anyway.
about to go to Weyland. The train station in Shenzhen was packed and it was very full because this was also during a holiday and to get on the train, they leave on time. So the amount of time that you get from being in the station to getting on the platform is quite tight, but we did catch our train. The trip from Shenzhen to Guilin was about four hours and it was really beautiful. So now we cue train ride aesthetics. We made it to Guilin, which has a very different vibe compared to the city we came from, Shenzhen, but also a really cool city to explore. Uh,
such a beautiful water bunt. I get so peace. Let's talk about the traffic I'm observing. So there's all kinds of different types of transportation methods moving in every single direction at the same time and no one's bumping into each other. So I found that quite fascinating. Also, a second thing, it's not noisy. Majority of all the cars and buses and bikes you see here, they're all running on electricity. So even though there's a lot going on, there is not that much noise pollution or air pollution. That's quite inspiring to see the possibilities. But still, when I think of the bigger picture about electric vehicles and the supply chain to make those things and the countries that would require those minerals to be supplied from them, mm, we'll get there. We'll get there. The adventure continues. We're in Guilin. We're going to go see some caves and some peaks. Very cool. The guide is fun. inside the caves was really cool to see like it's so inspiring to get to experience art created by earth you know like look at this the reflections the structures all that earth created now obviously people added the lights and the music and you know stairs who don't have to be slipping and sliding but it was really fun to walk through yes it was cooler in here and kind of dark but still really beautiful like look look it looks like a portal isn't that neat
The Umbrella Sisters are here. Being very, very Chinese style. Very oh, Asian style. Asian style. Yes. Oh, we went around. I was like wondering where the heck we were. Okay, so we're here at the mountains. It was a one hour drive. Yay. Ooh. Ooh, I like
I like her outfit. Right, yeah. I guess it's for a photo shoot. We went to this restaurant for dinner where they're serving traditional Chinese food. And I really did try to practice with chopsticks. And as you can see, we are obviously sisters because the entire time I'm really making an effort, Damali is roasting me. But I'm proud to say I did get some of the food in my mouth with these chopsticks. But don't worry, I did not starve. I eventually did do you see what she's doing? Do you see? And I was trying. Anyways, eventually I did end up switching to a spoon and I finished all the vegetables that you see on the table. incorporated dance, theater, lights, all on the water with the mountains. It was absolutely breathtaking, beautiful, and creative, and really impressive. The next day, we had the morning to explore on our own, and the afternoon, we had our train ride back to Shenzhen. So, first, walking along the waterfront, do you see this? Isn't this cute? There are a variety of different groups doing social dancing. You already know how I love social dancing, and so I really would love for us to do something like this in the city I live in, please. Like, can we add daytime activities like this? Thank you. While we continued walking, we also, went through this garden and decided to explore a pagoda. If you don't already know, a pagoda is a tower-like structure 
usually made out of a combination of brick and wood that is associated with a Buddhist or sometimes Taoist temple complex. At the train station, we're leaving Guilin and heading back to Shenzhen. Thank you. 
This part of the city was really enjoyable to explore. Here they have this exhibit where they're simulating what this city looked like back in ancient times. And I just found it so cool in terms of how they were able to preserve the space, paying homage and tribute to history, but also modernize it with shops, cafes, residential, commercial, in all these winding avenues and streets. It was such a vibe, like full of so much character. It was, I loved it. Absolutely loved it so much that we came back a few days later so that we could explore it at our own pace because during this time we were going with a guide. So hands down to the side, up and all around, if I had to suggest one of my top places, I would say Nantu City is the place to go. If you are creative and like to take photos, videos, and want to be inspired, or also you really enjoy exploring, discovering interesting boutiques and cafes with just unique stuff, this is where you need to be. Next, we went to this museum where we got to see some of China's history and specifically the city of Shenzhen's history. We are now at the Shenzhen, Shen, Shenzhen Museum. It's like, I think I would like it more if I were a tourist, mm. right? Of course, being a tourist is for being a patron. Yes. I can always do it. There's a lot of people here because it's a holiday for them, a national holiday. <laughs>
exploring this museum, especially learning about the story behind Shenzhen. This city is about 10 years old as of the making of this video, and it was really interesting to learn, or get a glimpse at least, of their story as to why they chose to build a city like this, dedicated to being a hub for international trade, a hub for tech, for business. It's just to be in a city that is so young, which when you think about it, like, do you do you think about that? Like the city you're in right now, do you do you even know how the age of it? So to be in one that's so young, it it you can feel it, but then you also get an extra glimpse of it going through this museum to take note of how much potential and excitement this city is carrying. Next, and we'll talk more about that later in this video. Next, we went out for lunch and our guide took us to this restaurant. And let me tell you, okay, this, this was a Chinese vegetarian restaurant. That means everything on this table is vegetarian. What? This, let me, this was one of my favorite meals. Okay, remember in, earlier in this trip, I showed you a cafe that I really loved. Yes, and we went twice. Okay, this one, this one is also on the list. I loved it. The food was great. Ambiance was great. Service was great. I mean, look, look at, look at the decor. Look at the vibes. So if you're here, go to the restaurant with a golden door. Okay. It's, it's worth it. You will love it. After our delicious meal, we had to walk through a bit of a commercial space to get to our next destination, which means we got to walk inside a mall. And there was a lot going on in the mall. It was a bit overwhelming, but it was still a vibe. was the Ping An Financial Center. This is currently the fourth tallest building in the world, the second tallest building in China, and it has a tourist attraction at the very top called Free Sky, while the rest of the building is offices. And all I can say is, wow. I'm just so grateful to have this experience. Like, is this a movie? Is this a video game? No, it's just a regular Tuesday. I, I just... This is what's so beautiful about getting to have the opportunity to travel because then you get to find out that some people out in this world are living in the future. No words needed, no caption needed. You're done. I'm just gonna let the music take it.
Our final stop was Shenzhen Talent Park, where there were statues and plaques dedicated to the talent and the story that built the city. Talent Park. Okay. Ah, so that's why all the all the statues are the talent yes. of the city. Yes. There's a gymnasium that keeps saying. Ah, got it, got it, got it. Okay. It is making sense. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Like wow. Just wow. They probably keep it like this. Oh, for sure. So they can maintain this. This is beautiful. One bolt The next day, we explored on our own, and we did a lot of walking. I also used this day to search for a special souvenir for me. I wanted to find a clothing item, either a vest, a top, a jacket that was traditional Chinese. You know, like the oriental silk with the embroidery, just original traditional vibes, okay? What is funny is that I did not realize going to a futuristic city looking for an old school traditional clothing item is a bit of a scavenger hunt. Everybody that we asked insisted you probably our best bet is to get this online. But finally, we were instructed and directed to go to this particular store. So here's a little story time. We went to this store. They only had dresses. I wasn't really looking for dresses, but we were like, hey, it took so long to even find a store. Let's see if you can find at least something so that you're not empty handed. The price tag in the window looked like it was in our range. So we kind of assumed that everything in the store was that. So I started trying on some dresses. This one right here was my very favorite. Like, look at the embroidery. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that gorgeous? Unfortunately though, it wasn't fully my size as in it was giving tight on the shoulders and giving like not enough for my waist. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't, the proportions was not working for me. So I continued trying on other dresses. I actually, for them, I'm a size large. And I continued trying on to find something that would work for me. Now, here's the lesson that happened here, okay? I just, I need to share this because I know this mindset thing, you know how we're into this, all right? I finally did decide on one of the dresses and then they gave us the price. I'm not gonna tell you what the price is, but just think you have a budget for shopping for a particular item and you find the item and the price tag is 10 times that budget. Okay, that's what this was. So 
This got me thinking two things. First of all, yes, I changed my clothes. I thank them very much. I did not purchase anything. I left the store. But my mindset behind that, I first was really inspired. This is the first time in my life I've ever touched or worn anything with the price tag that these dresses had. The level of quality was so inspiring. Like the zipper, it disappears. The inside is a different silk with a completely different embossed material. This, like this craftsmanship is really intricate and detailed, really beautiful. But my reasoning for not purchasing these dress, this dress or these dresses was not about, oh, the price is too much or that's not okay for me. Instead, my mindset was I am worthy of this price tag. The reason why I'm not getting it is because this is not exactly what I want. I wanted a jacket or a vest, something I can mix and match. I can't do that with this dress. I also need something that truly fits me and my proportions. And none of these dresses were doing that for me. So I just wanted to share that because I felt this was a really beautiful, proud moment and lesson when it comes to being open to receive the abundance you deserve and not clinging to a lack mindset, even if you're in a room or have an experience that you have never been exposed to before. The next day we continued exploring and one of the highlights was finding this really cool Thai restaurant which we actually found by accident and this was one of my favorite meals on my list of favorite meals during this trip. It was giving everything, okay? The layers of flavors was so delicious. The ambiance was great, the service was great and the DJ was serving when it came to his mix. So it was a really lovely evening.
We are here walking my last full day on this trip. Yeah. Yeah. We had our breakfast. Shenzhen. 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 It's a beautiful day. Again, it's a little overcast, but it makes it a bit cooler. And it's not as muddy. One of the many highlights for today was returning to this special spot to explore on our own. Now, do you remember previously when I was trying on those dresses looking for a special souvenir? Okay, so today we had a full circle moment. You ready to hear about it? Okay, story time. We're walking, we're exploring. Then my sister Damali says, hey, let's check out this boutique. We go inside, it's cute. And then I feel inspired because I see a hallway and I ask, can we go to the back? And they say, yes, we can go to the back. And there I find, do you wanna know what I found? A room full of exactly what I wanted. Jackets, vests, tops, capes, blazers with the beautiful, traditional, original craftsman artisanship embroidery silk, buttons, the whole vibe. Like it was even more than what I could have imagined in terms of what I wanted for my special souvenir. And the price tag was a range that was in the spectrum of our range. Like, look at this. Isn't that beautiful? It's a cape. Look, just, oh, fabulous, darling, fabulous. So I was over the moon and the sky and back in finding these gems and really enjoyed trying them on. And yes, I did find something that was for me. And what was even more beautiful about this was not only was it exactly what I wanted, but also this boutique has heritage pieces in terms of what they call it. So this is local craftsmanship, artisanship, local business. It's, it's a, it's a piece that is a future heirloom that also holds history and culture and a great conversation piece, which I will be rocking in multiple ways for the next hundred years. And it's just giving what I needed it to give. So this was a fabulous time. I really appreciate it. And so beautiful in terms of a pleasant surprise in finding this. Where you come from? Ah, so I told him Wakanda. Him. Yeah, Wakanda. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, your face is like covered by the. <laughs> but I see this now. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. How about that? You buy it. Ah, okay. How about that? Ah, I think. Uh, buy it. Yeah, buy it. The. 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 Yeah, bu
Ah, okay. So this is a white one. Mm. Yeah, if you wanted to try a, a white one. Mm. Does that fit a little bit more? Um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's pretty. Does it fit a little bit fitter? Mm -hmm. so, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's fine. That's pretty though. Mm -hmm. The color is very well. I mean, of course, the red color is very yes, yes, popping. very, very, very poppy. Like if this was in red, in the mirror, I think I would love it too. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. But yeah, they're, I think they're all very pretty. It's supposed to be a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's pretty. This is yeah. Can you see the full? Yeah. Now I can. Oh no 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 oh no 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 no. Yeah, it's Piaoliang. He's up up. Piaoliang is very pretty. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. No, I like it. Mm -hmm. I love all my own. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, 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 the customer service was also great. Like, look at these pieces. You will definitely find unique statement pieces here. The ladies were really happy <laughs> with my purchase. They even gave me a free gift, a really beautiful bookmark. So if you ever come here, make sure to check out this boutique. The tag reads Shenzhen Manzu Culture Company, part of the China Intangible Cultural Heritage. Thank you so much. I'm so happy with my purchase. Can't wait to rock it a million different ways. Nanto City. Uh, Nan, Nan, oh. Nanto is like South, Nanto is like head. Okay, so South Head City. Head <laughs> of the South Don't City. Don't say it like that. Uh. But isn't this lovely? I love the red clay aesthetic. Oh, that color. Sorry. But it's so beautiful and it's so, I love how it's all like small things inside. You have to go inside. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> yeah. I'll be hanging out in this space if I was here. Yeah. No, it's lovely. I like it. Oh, a
I was in the bathroom to clean it and surreptitiously took her, her phone out and I surreptitiously looked the other way. Uh -huh. <laughs> so annoying. Yeah. But I'm like, you didn't ask. Right, right. Oh, what's over there? Right, but look at the, yeah, the bridge over there. We're still exploring Nantu City. There's so much here, it's so beautiful. <laughs> So this means, this means, this means long live the martyrs. That's, that's, that's what's behind all me. you'll hear on WhatsApp. This, I was going to use this for YouTube, but okay. Awkward. Thanks. So this is oh. a monument for, in terms of the translation that we have created for oh. ourselves. Okay, so martyr, martyr is me, me a ship. Okay. It's personal. Martyr. Word? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Martyr means. Yes. So one of those symbols means martyr. The third and fourth one. Okay. Is, yes. yes. So it's, this is paying tribute to martyrs yeah. of some kind. That is what well, our translation has helped us with. Let's go up there. Let's see what's over there. We're gonna go see. Later. So we're still walking. Now we're kind of, this is leaving that Nantu city. I'm not sure what this is called, but we're continuing exploring. And this is so beautiful, like, such an expansive park that's well manicured, but still natural. And it's a little cooler due to the shade. It's lovely, it's so peaceful. Get my steps in. Oh yeah, this is so beautiful. I'm grateful. Okay, so look, each tree has a QR code on it, yeah? To let you know about the tree. Like what? Look at these roots. Oh my god. And look how big and beautiful it is. Oh, that's so neat. And each tree, look, the one next to it. I told you about the tree. Okay, wait, show it so I can show it on the so when you scan it, this is what it shows you. Like where it is. Which about there's it. pictures of the tree and then this is information about it? Yeah. Like how tall it is, mm -hmm. the name, mm -hmm. what else? Yeah. And its location. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. They show, oh, they have a full picture of the where the tree is. So if you want to, you know, remember where the tree is, there is. Oh, wow. That's so neat. Another thing I noticed in this very beautiful park is that there are a variety of sculptures and statues. And the sculptures depict certain historical figures. And a difference that I noted was that 
for people who are important within the history of dynasties were depicted like larger than life and somewhat of an abstract art. While people who are from modern history tend to be normal size and nothing is really over embellished. I thought that was interesting. Not sure if I'm looking too much into it, but I, I thought that was neat in terms of, again, another layer of how people are being intentional of telling their own story and how they want to showcase it or illustrate it. All right, we're still making our way through this beautiful park and gradually the cars are sounding louder so we think since now we can see some buildings of the skyline we're figuring we're getting closer to the exit. Look at these trees! Like, it's so beautiful to see trees that were allowed to exist in their beautiful extravagance that they're meant to be. Like, look how tall they are! Oh, it's so beautiful. Thank you, trees. It was lovely visiting. Thank you so much. Hey, I see the road. We got the road. Hmm. Okay. Core Socialist Values Theme Park of Shenzhen Zuan Park. Yes. Oh, and here's a map. That's what I was looking for. But no, this is awesome. So we met the park. We're near a highway now. Somali wants to get a DD, which is a an E car hailing thing. But that was beautiful. I loved it touring the park. That was very enjoyable. Now you see the behind me. Yeah. Ooh. I should stop walking. We got these steps in. But yeah, that was fun. That was a fun tip story. Up next, I had my very first KTV experience. <laughs> this was a lot of fun and it was actually at this time that i realized i had not done karaoke in a really long time not because i was running away from it it just the opportunity just has not arised in a while so this was really fun this was actually on my list of like if i am coming to asia any part in asia i need to experience ktv so I'm going to tell you right now, KTV is very dangerous. You could spend the whole day here and not realize it because there are no windows or no clock. And they don't mind if you just keep on adding more time to your time there. So we did, I think we did like two sessions. I think that's about two hours there, but it was fun. We put together a nice playlist. It took us a little while to find the artists on their tablet thingamajig. But it was, it was really fun. It was a nice, as always, it was a nice bonding experience and just really enjoyable. Now, you should already know 
what I chose from my playlist, okay? So the, at the beginning, we had to start with like five or six songs with the most amazing artist of the most amazing artist of all time, okay? So I'm gonna share some clips with you. I hope I can do this with the sound. Let's see. And for dinner, we went to this Thai restaurant, which was fabulous. This was actually one of my favorite meals on my list of favorite meals on this trip. The food was delicious. The ambiance was cute. The customer service was great. I loved it. And to be honest now, Thailand is next on my list because their food is giving me what I needed to give. Granted, compared to the, oh, I see a mask looking like the Phantom of the Opera. So we can see it behind me over here. You see it? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> what? I can't take her anywhere. Oh my goodness. Anyway, as I was saying before, I was interrupted. Compared to like the crowds we had earlier today, it is quite like not that many people. So I'm not sure if these buildings are offices or not, but it's still a beautiful space. <laughs> oh, this is called Splendid China. We are at Splendid China, which apparently showcases all the regions of China. Let's walk up the stairs without tripping.
This was the last day of my trip, and since my flight was in the evening, we decided to take the morning to explore something called Splendid China. Now, here's here's the thing. When my sister explained we're going to Splendid China, she said it's miniature replicas of historical sites in China. So I thought, for some reason in my mind, I thought that mean like Legos, like that size. Okay, turns out it's not at all. Actually, everything looks very big and nothing looks miniature to me here. So we also discovered that, to be honest, if you want to explore this space, you need an entire day and you should be dressed for that too. So we did get to explore a bit for the hours that we had, but if you want the full experience, I would suggest spend the day here, mostly in the afternoon and evening, afternoon and evening, because they also have some really cool shows lined up for the evening and nighttime. Still at Splendid China. Okay. Well, yes, of course. Okay. Let me get my umbrella out. Oh, this is It's time for me to leave. Here we are now at the airport for my departure. I had already checked in and I'm now looking for, I think I was looking for snacks like peanuts or something to take with me. And then this first flight ended up being late, delayed in leaving. So I ended up leaving at night. So I didn't get to see 
the city in the daytime in the air, but that's okay. Overall, really loved my trip. And thankfully I did get to see Addis Ababa in the daytime. So I had to take these clips while I'm sitting in my Ethiopian Airlines plane, heading back to Accra. And now we're back on the purple couch. And I wanted to share with you a snippet of some of my reflections about the trip. Of course, throughout this trip, I shared different things, but there are three main things that I needed to elaborate on, which I'm going to do more so in the blog post for this video or for this trip. So I'm going to write it out, but I wanted to share a snippet of it with you in video form because I needed to create an occasion to wear this beautiful piece that I got on my trip. Like, isn't it? Look, 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 look. <laughs> and then I added, I'm wearing something else underneath it to give it, to see how I like it with sleeves. Anyway, so first thing I would like to share with you is overall going on this trip, to me, it felt like I was traveling to the future completely. And I don't know if that is the same case for every other part of the country of China, but I think due to going to such a newly created city, which is Shenzhen, it really felt like time traveling. It really looked like everybody there is just living way ahead of everybody else. And that was really inspiring. So when it comes to China and Chinese people, like y'all have a lot to be proud of. I'm sure there's different types of frustrations and things that you go through because I'm really on the outside looking in, but compared to where the rest of the world is at, like y'all have a lot to be proud of. Y'all have a lot to be excited about. And to be honest, you really don't need to be listening to anybody else's criticism for the most part, because they have no idea what they're talking about. If they've never bothered to step foot and see this for what it is, like irrelevant, completely insignificant, okay? So thank you so much for just being you because the amount of innovation and strategy and funding and, and discipline that's required to create what you guys have over there is just wow. Congratulations, like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. So continue to go forth and prosper, like, yes, awesome. Now, in addition to that, I could not help but also take note that while I was looking at all of this and feeling so inspired, the, the inspiration wasn't only like, whoa, futuristic, yes. It was also like, wow, if this is what it means to build new cities, then there's still hope that we can develop a world that is more like accommodating for everybody and really takes everyone into account. And it did get me thinking of like, so where in this galaxy will that be a thing for black people? Because at this moment in time, I'm not sure if we have that yet. And for a very long period of time, we've been drumming the beat of insisting that we'll need to be in Africa. And I'm not sure yet if we are really moving towards that in a way that can mean that we end up like what I was seeing on this trip. Not that we need to copy them because these are different cultures and different priorities, but to be able to build in that way where you really are accounting for everybody and you really have a like the strategy is not just what's happening now and next year, but the strategy is also like what's here and 20 years from now. Like it's it's just so much bigger. And it, it did get me thinking about that and creating ideas of how that could be. So check the blog post, diagnosnovia.com, where I will elaborate more on those ideas. Because I know I've already kept you so much in this video. So, but let me know. I can do another video going more into that. The second thing. The way history is documented in these two cities. In particular, we, we did more of museum visits in Shenzhen, while I think in Guilin it was more 
nature and like natural beauty uh, visitations, yes, or exploring. And I really loved the way in Shenzhen, they were very intentional on documenting, packaging, and showcasing the story that they want to tell about themselves. And I loved, if you recall, in the in the video, previously in this video, where they had mannequins replicating certain parts of their history. They had that like simulation where it's a room, but because of the way it's moving, it's like you are walking through their ancient city. Then even at the Talent Park is where there are, there are sculptures and plaques telling you the types of Chinese, like all the different Chinese diasporans that they brought back to create this city and what they contributed. And then there's even a museum also dedicated to that talent where you see their faces, what they were doing outside, when they came back, what they did, some are dead, some are still alive, all of that. And it was just so beautiful, I think, to, to see what it could look like when people are allowed to exist and people are allowed to tell their own story. And what I also noted was that the majority of people who were the guests in the museum or in the park were majority Chinese people. And so I could see how deliberate and intentional this is of making sure that this is not so much about foreigners need to know what our story is. It's about, no, we are reiterating our story so our people always know what they're capable of and what they have already done and what our values are. Because it's kind of listed as you look at the story of this is what they value, right? And I thought that was so awesome and so cool. And it got me thinking, as always, it got me thinking of how we can do that for African history, how we can do that for Ghana history, how can we do that for Black global history? And especially in the African context, as we are in this era of we're trying to boost tourism, making African countries a tourist destination, and wanting to showcase culture, showcase history, showcase the country. And in Ghana, a lot of tourist sites or attempts to let me show you Ghana's history um, is not like this. And there is room for more museums. There is room for reenacting Ghana's story. But I, I feel like the intention behind that, this is what I was reflecting on, is and the intention behind that should not only be for tourists to come, it should be that you are reiterating the story that pushes like pride for your people, that pushes uh, or encourages or inspires pride and encouragement and motivation and inspiration for your own. But it also is amazing that of course tourists will love and come and see it because like it's amazing, right? And it would be lovely if we could do that outside of only using relics of colonization for our tourist attractions. No offense, to the slave castle, no offense to the port, no offense to you know those things. And it's, only, it's not only Ghana, because even a previous video that I did, because I did visit Benin earlier this year, and their tourism also, there's a lot of relics of colonization, relics of slave trade is what the tourism is. While there's so much more to the story that we could utilize so many different methods of storytelling, packaging, and showcasing beyond walk, taking people to walk through those sorts of relics. But then it also got me thinking, do we have, do we have that information? Like, could we do a museum where we, are re we have mannequins reenacting what Accra was, what this region was before it was named Accra, before colonizers were here, before the borders were created, do we have that documentation? Can we reenact that so then your, your guests can walk through it? Or it's simulated so they sit while the video moves them through it? Do we have that? Could we do that? Would that be seen as valued here? 
So that also got me thinking and I do have some ideas for that and I will share that in the blog post as well for this because it also got me thinking like comparing it to the, the newly renovated Kwame Nkrumah Museum and Mausoleum, Mausoleum Museum uh, here and what more could be done in such a space too that that could give the people here as well as tourist attraction and tourist money like I'm seeing like I saw on this trip and finally the third last part of my reflection that I want to share a snippet with has to do with this dynamic of Africa-China relations. Okay. This trip added a few more layers in my understanding of the different angles that Africa-China relations are participating in, forming, transforming, evolving. Yes. Now a fun fact, a few years ago, I served as an editor for an online publication called Africans on China. And that publication was focused on taking the discussions about what's going on between these regions away or moving it beyond government agreements, multinational corporation arrangements, and bringing it to the people who are actually on the ground having different experiences, whether it's on the ground because you have a Chinese population in your African country, or on the ground as an, an African student or an African person is having experiences in China themselves. And our writers were African university students, or those in that, yeah, African university students, where I was editing everyone's content and posting it, as well as training them in editorial writing, which is very different from university or school writing. And through that, getting to learn quite a bit that I don't, I have yet to really see on mainstream media when it comes to how do young Africans feel about China's presence on the continent and in their own country? Or what do they feel about going to China? Or what do they feel about Chinese people? And taking out that there is quite a spectrum and variety of some people might be in the bandwagon of anti-China propaganda. Some people on this side where they actually think it's amazing and they would prefer going that route and not a Western route. And some people in the middle who kind of are neutral and don't really have, um, have yet to form a full opinion due to not having much of an experience yet. With this trip, what it added for me was that there is, from my experience, all right, let me know if this resonates with you. From my experience, there seems to be a very big gap between the government agreements, trade arrangements, multi-corporation connections, Silk Road directions, and the real people on the ground. So I'm going to give two examples, okay? And again, I'm going to go, I'll elaborate more of this in my blog post, but I want to give two examples here in the video because this fit is serving. So my first example is my experience on this trip. To travel there, I took the routing of going to Accra, to Addis Ababa, to Shanghai, to Shenzhen. This means Accra to Addis Ababa and Addis Ababa to Shanghai, I was on Ethiopian Airlines. Now. Ethiopian Airlines themselves, I thought was a wonderful company. It was my first time getting to uh, fly with them. And I loved, I loved their airport. I loved the plane. It was spacious to an extent. I mean, I was still sitting in the cargo pit, but it was spacious to an extent. I loved just having a whole crew just be blackity black, black and professional and just have that personality, like I loved it. And then also the, the videos that they have where it's like, come visit Ethiopia, come invest in Ethiopia. It just, it was awesome. I loved it. I was like, yes, this is what more of us need. And hopefully every other African country can like present themselves like that. So yay. So that was good. That was good. The thing that was different from good 
on this, these two legs of my three leg trip was that the entire population of my passengers, my fellow passengers on this flight were all Chinese, mostly all Chinese men coming from Accra to Addis Ababa to Shanghai. And I don't want to make, now when I, when I share what happened with this group of passengers, I, I really am not trying to generalize a whole population. I'm, I'm sharing this to try and illustrate where I'm seeing a gap happening and why there might be a mismatch of how we can further leverage these connections. So I don't want to automatically assume that because, the, and the plane was full, I don't want to automatically assume that the plane was full of Chinese men because they're all Chinese miners doing galamse in Ghana. I don't want to assume that. And I'll, I'll get a little bit to galamse in a moment. But the way these passengers behaved on this plane, they were very rude and disrespectful to the crew. They would do things like just take stuff from the cart they would push the cart with the lady with it because they need to get by or they need to get into their seat. They would stand in the back and just take stuff from the cupboards. And you know, it's a plane. I don't know if you've been on a plane, you know that like, that's not what you're supposed to, it's not your plane. Like that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You ask the crew member to get something. Yeah. Um, and, and then they would just be like really loud and like sneezing into the air and coughing into the air and just really gross. It was, it was just really gross. And then unfortunately, the two men that were sitting beside me, the one in the middle, cause I'm in the aisle seat, the one in the middle kept on needing to like, get up, twice, get up. And I'm like, okay. Third time he gets up and he kind of like falls on the other guy on the other side. And I'm standing there like, you good? Like what is, I, what, I don't know. So his friend gets up, tries to help him, and then turns and tells me in English, oh, he drank too much beer. And I'm like, okay. So he sits him back down and he goes to the crew member. The crew member comes back and she's like, oh, you're sick? Okay, well, here's the, go to the bathroom. Okay, well, you know where the bathroom is. And also here's a paper bag. She leaves because the crew are like, have had it up to here with these passengers. So they're being professional, but they're also being kind of like, I'm not going to go all overboard to help you because unfortunately, all these passengers have been a bit of a nuisance to the crew members on this flight. This man proceeds to vomit on my seat, okay? Now, thankfully for him, I'm not sitting on my seat. I'm standing right in the aisle, like a row back because I thought he was going to get up because he was instructed to go to the bathroom. He chooses to do that and then vomit into the bag. His friend is standing there. His friend leaves, comes back and brings tissue, trying to wipe my seat. And then they put their blankets on my seat. Maybe, I guess, as a gesture of trying to be helpful. Okay, so, okay, okay. So I gesture to them saying, thank you. I get my bag, which thankfully was way underneath the seat. So it did not get hit by the vomit. I get my bag and I jump off the plane because there was no other reason why I should be on this plane. Because how? Because of all the other people in the plane, of course someone should vomit on my seat. Like, are you, are you kidding me? We still have like eight more hours in this journey. Why? So, and that was the end of the journey because I already jumped out of the plane. So yeah, anyways, uh, <laughs> that's what I felt though. Like I really wanted to just like open the door already. Cause like, why am I here? So I ended up walking to the back. I let the crew member know that, hey, I can't sit in my seat anymore because do you do you remember the guy who was sick so he vomited on my seat i'm not gonna sit there is there anywhere else i can sit or can i just stand back here with y'all even though back there is not any more peaceful because there are passengers back there taking stuff out of cupboards and causing a mess for the crew members 
So this crew member, she apologizes. She walks over trying to find another seat for me. She calls towards the front of the plane to ask if there's any space. But unfortunately, this whole plane is full. So she finds another seat for me. It's still in the cargo pit section. And now I have to sit in the middle of two men. I don't think I don't think I even like slept for the like I didn't sleep for that leg of the flight because I just felt so just gross and disgusted. Yeah. Now I share this with you again, not to generalize that an entire population must be like this. But if because but juxtaposing that what I observed and what I personally experienced to the types of Chinese people I saw in Shenzhen and Guilin and Shanghai. I was like, okay, where did you, wh why, are, why, why are we choosing to send, why is there such a stark difference between the two? And again, I don't, I'm not generalizing that every Chinese person in Africa must be like the ones on this plane. I hope and trust they're not. I'm sure they're not. But it just got me thinking of like, there's a serious gap happening if for Africans on the ground, the only exposure they have to Chinese people is this, this what I saw on the plane. This is the only exposure and experience Africans will have on the ground. Why? would they want anything to do with Chinese people if that's the only exposure they've had? And I get it, we're not supposed to generalize. I get it. But similar to how if an African goes to China and does something that is considered bad, so now all Africans are gonna to have to deal with that reputation, the reverse is the same thing. That if you are sending a certain type of Chinese person to come and work on the mines, work on building the stadium, work on, on whatever else, whatever other business, trade, whatever they're doing, but this is their, and even though they get the work done, obviously, because that's why they're there, but their, their interpersonal, their social, their interactions are like this. It's, like, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, are we, there's no, like diplomatic, these are represent representatives of China. You know, like there's, I don't see that if this is how they're being allowed to behave. Cause it makes me wonder, would you do the same thing if you were on a KLM flight? If that same group of people were on a KLM flight or a Delta flight or just a flight where it wasn't African people serving them, would they behave the same way? I don't know. I haven't observed that yet. Let me know if you know. But I, that was, I really was taken aback. I was not expecting that at all. Yes, of course, I've heard about what Chinese are doing or not doing here. And I also had extra knowledge of what I mentioned about being an editor. But I had never, I was, I was not expecting to be that disgusted and then have that be so completely different from what I'm experiencing when I actually go and be in China. So there's a gap here that I feel is not, I, I don't see how that's going to be a benefit for everyone involved if we're choosing that. The second part to that is, like I noted, Galamse. All right, if you know what Galamse is, cool. If you don't, it's that there's mining happening here in Ghana and solely the leads of the mining extraction is coming from Chinese corporations. Now they didn't just come KK by themselves. Obviously they are signed off and endorsed to be doing this. Unfortunately, for the time that they've been doing this, all the extraction they've been doing has been very destructive to the environment. So much so in terms of the destruction that the water, the water, the bodies of water in these regions are completely contaminated the soil is contaminated. And again, like I noted, if the personalities of these people are like this, I'm pretty sure those who live near where the mining is happening is also not having the most fun with their minor neighbors. 
minor m-i-n-e-r because they're like mining yeah and what has been going on in terms of how the Galamse story is being reported here locally is that uh, the Chinese miners are being painted as the villain in this story. Now, here's the thing. I'm not claiming they're saints. Obviously, they're doing the mining. So, I mean, I get it why you would do that. But there's two issues that I, I have with that. One, the way they're doing the mining here, where it's completely just destroying everything around it. And just being very messy. Yes, it's hard labor, but it's very messy. Compared to what I saw in Shenzhen and Guilin, where they have serious construction going on, but they do it in such a neat, clean way. Like it's a skyscraper for like 50 floors in the middle of the city, but it's the way they situate their boulders and the equipment and the cement it doesn't cause an issue for anybody around the building. There is no noise pollution. There is no construction pollution. There is no trash. It's really tight and clean. And their bodies of water are clean. So I'm like, I'm seeing that over there in your home country in China, y'all know how to do construction, do mining, do renovating, neat and clean and correct. So you can have your beautiful parks and gardens and mountains and water bases and your fish with the whiskers floating around, great. So why is it you come here and just be messy? Why not do the same thing here? You can extract the stuff without destroying the water. You can extract the stuff without leaving the land completely barren like that. So that means you're doing that on purpose. It's not inevitable to be so destructive. So that's one thing, that's one note on that. The second thing is Ghana is not completely absolved of responsibility as to having this gallon say thing happen. And so I do have a bit of an issue when local media reports on it as if Ghana is a complete innocent victim sometimes in this, when it's like, China, these miners did not invade your country illegally. A Ghanaian person took them by the hand and, and escorted them to where they're doing their mining. And some Ghanaian person got paid for it too. Yes? And there are not only Chinese miners, there's Ghanaian miners too. And if, and so the people on the ground who are doing the hard labor in the heat, these are not the people who are the villains in the story, yes? They're both kind of rough on the edges and they're both hungry. So you're, it's kind of inevitable that unfortunately violence or crime might break out in those spaces because you basically set them up for it, yes? So focusing on whenever these sorts of things are being reported, which for some, the details are important, taking note of like, if this continues, there will be a ripple effect of health concerns for the people who live there because, well, now where are they going to get clean water from? If the soil is contaminated, anything growing out of it is going to have a problem, right? So what is it supposed to use instead, right? So that's all valid issues that are concerning. But also taking note that the focus should not be on the folks who are physically on the ground doing the mining and the hard labor, the, fo the focus of who is facilitating all of this are the people who are getting paid the most for this. And those are never the ones who are in your pictures or your videos when you want to do your investigative report about Galamse. It's, it's, it's never them. So to me, it's like, I don't see how are we solving or resolving any of it if we're not being honest about who are the actual perpetu perpetrators? Perpetuators. Who are the actual ones facilitating and chopping and getting paid for that? And reflecting on that does sadden me because 
it kind of reminds me why we don't have a futuristic city yet that also showcases, packages, celebrates a Black people. Because a thing like Galamse could only happen in a country where those who are in charge don't mind allowing others to rape their country and chopping money while it's happening. And that's really devastating. I'm not to say, it's not to say that those who are in charge of Shenzhen are saints and like they definitely don't do anything wrong for their people. It's not to say that, but Shenzhen is a city that has no slum. There are no slums. There's no so-called um, underserved, impoverished region of the city. Do you know what that means? One, it means like, wow, you could actually, that means slums are not inevitable. Underserved, impoverished, blatant poverty is not inevitable, is not a default, is not something we should just accept because that's how it always is. When there's a slum in the city, I feel like that's a direct, when there's a slum in a city, when there's an impoverished region in a city, when there's a obvious destruction happening in a region, I see that as a direct reflection of the folks who are in power, drop the bag, fumbled the bag, and are completely slacking. Because if you were doing your job, there would be no reason for this to happen. Similar to in Shenzhen, they're doing their job. That's why there's no reason for anybody to have to develop a slum because they're not being served. They must all be served in some shape or form in order for there to be no slum. They were like, there was nobody throughout all of Shenzhen. There was nobody without a home. There was nobody walking around asking for money, asking for food, none whatsoever, regardless of what neighborhood you were in. There's definitely, not everybody is living the same. I could, I could observe that a little bit, but even the neighborhoods that had a little hustle edginess to it were still cleaner. <laughs> and those people still had somewhere to sleep and still was able to eat. And then when I see that we're having Galam say here, continuing regardless of how many reports or how many people say stuff or how many people cry over it. It just makes me reflect on whether or not we will ever really have that level of discipline in order to have a futuristic region like that for a different group of people. And it makes me question how, if ever, that could be on the continent. So I'll elaborate on that more, because of course there's more to discuss or elaborate or dissect on that, but I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that in the blog post. Yes? <laughs> Thank you so much. If you got all the way to this point of the video, you're a real one. I love you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. As always, make sure you check out the blog post for this video, because of course I also took a whole bunch of photos and there's some writings and reflections and musings I had to share with you as well. So that's at diagnosinovia.com and the link is in the description. And I do love hearing from you. So please comment either here in the video or over on the blog post so we can continue the conversation on any aspect of this trip or what I was just reflecting on. But I'm really, I'm really grateful I got to experience this trip and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to get to share this with you. So I, I hope and trust you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. Take care. I'll see you next time.